Okay, welcome. So today we will not be joined by people in the U.S. because they have a holiday. I think we should also start having more holidays here in Switzerland. And so we stopped last time. We looked a bit at runtime errors, and we discussed that there is no ideal way for your Simpson library, for example, to deal with an error. If it returns zero, then nobody knows whether that's the real value of the integral or an error message, the same with infinity or another number. If I abort, then that's bad. If the, 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 the poke it's mission critical like an airplane or a nuclear power plant. When I set an error flag, then I just don't know whether the caller will ever check it. So what a library can always do is it can always recognize there's a problem. But it can never know what is the best way of dealing with the problem. What the caller can typically know is how to handle the problem might just be okay to abort. Or I might have to really do something critical. And so the, 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 the exceptions were discussed last time as a way of letting the library inform the caller that there was a problem. What I want to discuss with you today is when should we use exceptions and when should we use asserts? Remember we had the, the, the assert macro. The, the, the assert macro checks something and simply abort it if the argument was false, unless if I compile and optimize, then it might just skip the check at all. So that's something very different. What I want to discuss with you is now, should we, in the Simpson example, when I call the Simpson function with a number of steps that's zero, should I check for that and throw an exception, or should I assert? What's your opinion? Can look at the code. Let me look at the code. We have a Simpson CPP here, and here I'm checking with an exception. If B less than A, throw a range error. If the number of steps is zero, throw a range error. What's the difference if instead of this, I'm just doing a third of A less than B, and I'm doing a third of n larger than zero. And of course, I have to include the CS third header. Should I do this instead? Do you have, what would you do? Yeah? Okay, so the answer was if the user might be able to deal with the exception, I should throw an exception. Otherwise, I can just assert and abort. How do you know whether the user can deal with it? Then it should crash, and it should crash with the airplane. No, okay, yeah, okay, but I think we're getting somewhere. If the caller knows how to deal with it, how can the caller know that you're throwing an exception? 
How does the caller know that this function might throw an exception? Might throw an exception. What does the, the caller get? The caller gets your header, and the caller gets the documentation. And now let's remember back what did we say about documentation? What should you document? The name of the function, the arguments, the semantics. Then we have preconditions and postconditions. The preconditions are the conditions that the user has to satisfy. So now it's our choice. Should we make it a precondition that n has to be larger than zero? If we make it a precondition, then we can assert, because if the caller violates the precondition, I can do anything I want. I can erase the disk, you know that, right? So I can crash the program. If the caller violates a precondition, then I can just abort. So I can either say a precondition is n has to be larger than zero. And then I can just assert on it. The assert just helps the, the user to find the precondition violation. So preconditions, I should always check with asserts. Because I don't give any guarantee that anything specific will happen if it's violated. It might deport or I might just do something else undetected. Something strange might come out. But if I don't make it a precondition, and if I document n can be anything, but if n is invalid, it throws an exception, then that's more flexible, right? Because that allows the, the caller to actually realize, oops, I called it, it the wrong number, and now I deal with it. If it's a precondition, then the caller has to carefully check beforehand that they are, are not violating it. So it's kind of a contract that you make with the users they are of the library. And the problem that you have when you don't make it a precondition, but when you say, I will throw an exception, is that then this is a documented part of your Simpson library. Your Simpson library has to maintain forever that if you call it with zero, it throws a nice and beautiful exception. So it just makes it, so when you throw the exception that makes zero a valid legal input to the function. With the Result being, you get back with an exception. If you make it a precondition that n should be larger than zero, then you don't have to maintain it. You can just assert on it, or you can ignore it, or whatever. So the answer is you, can, you should either make it a precondition, and then you're fine off and check nothing, or you make it a precondition and assert to help the caller. Or you say, no, you can call it with anything, and if you give me the, me the, the invalid input, I will throw an exception. That might be the nicest way of doing it, but it's more work for you. So you just have to think about it. Should you make it a precondition, or, or do you want to throw an exception? And the moment the first user uses your library and relies on the, the behavior, then it's over. You can always turn a precondition later into to something valid and to throw an exception. Because you never made any guarantee of what you do if you violate it. So if the user calls it with zero, but the precondition was that it should be larger than one, then you can do anything, including throwing an exception. But once you have documented that it throws an exception, then you can't go back. So think about what you want to do. Does it make sense for the user to catch that, or should the user check beforehand that it's a valid value? So for n, I would say it probably makes more sense to make it a precondition. The, 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 the exception might be if you realize there's a pole in your function or something else goes on that you can't make the integral, which the user can't easily check beforehand. Okay, and then there are a few details that I skipped over, namely when you do the catch and you catch a certain exception, 
then this catches not only that type, but also any other exception that is de de derived from it. So in the standard, the base class of, uh, of uh, exception was the, the, the state exception. From that, they derived the logic error and the random error and then more the range error and so on. If you catch a stood exception that catches all the other ones that are de derived from it. Then you might do a catch just to print a statement, hey, there's a problem, but then you don't know what else to, uh, else, uh, to, to, to do. And so you can do a catch, print something, and then just write throw. And that throws the same exception again and looks for the next catch clause plus further upstream in the call chain. What else do we have? Uncalled exception. If you don't catch it, the program will just abort. That's fine. There's this throw qualifier, throw nothing, that declares to the user that this function will never throw any exception if you add that after function. Why is that useful? It's useful that then you, you, you will just know that it doesn't throw any exception. Is it really useful? No, because how should the compiler guarantee that this function will never throw an exception? You call a function which calls some other function of some library, which calls some other function, which calls, calls some kernel function. So how can the compiler guarantee that a function will never throw an exception. Simply you have to catch an exception, and if there is one, we have to abort. So what this does is it simply makes sure that it doesn't throw an exception by making your code run slower. It's not very useful. Then uh, okay, the only point where it's useful is when we look at the declaration of the the exception class. These all words are no throw exception. The constructor doesn't throw, the what function doesn't throw, the destructor doesn't throw. Why is that when I'm throwing an exception, I don't want any exception to occur. Or in case I want to throw an exception and there's an exception occurring while I want to create the exception, then I'm in serious trouble. Then it, the, then it should just abort. It should just catch them and say, hey, no, stop, 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 abort. It, it doesn't work anymore. That's why these uh, uh, no throw statements should show up here, but basically there's nowhere else. Then there's been a long discussion about should you put an exception in a constructor or should you put an exception into a destructor of a class? And the book by Straustrap has the wrong recommendation. Straustrap recommends it's very bad to throw exception in constructors, but it's safe to throw them in destructors. Most people now think the opposite. Why should you not throw an exception in a destruct? The destructor should just clean up everything around the object. <coughs> if an exception is thrown, then you go out of that function and you want to destroy all your local objects. You go, go, go up and out until you reach the catch, and all the local variables have to be destroyed cleanly. If in, during this process one of those destructors throws an exception, then, you, then we have problems, because we can't really destroy it and to, to clean it up. It should always be possible to clean up something without the cleanup be, uh, be stopping with an exception. But it's totally fine if in a constructor you throw an exception. What that will do is it will just not make the object. That's fine. So let's say we want to construct an array and I give it a size of 50 trillion and I don't have the memory. It's totally fine if the constructor throws an exception saying I'm out of your memory and that's because nothing bad has happened because the, the, the array was just not constructed. But the destructor should always be able to clean up. So now, before we go to, 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 to optimization, I want to show you an, an overview of uh, the procedural programming 
modular programming. And, yes, you have a question. Oh, good question. The question was, just for the recording, what if in a constructor I throw an exception after I've allocated some memory, will that memory never be cleaned? Why would you throw an exception? Because maybe you want to allocate two different objects in the constructor. And so the first one might succeed, the second one might fail, then it aborts, but you still have allocated memory for the first one. That's a very good point, but I usually discuss in the program and techniques two class when I give it, so maybe it's time to, to, to teach it again. And basically the idea is that every object you have should be responsible only for a single resource, and not for two resources. You should never have something that is responsible for two blocks of memory. So if your example was, let's say I have something that contains two arrays. Class X. And in there I want to create int star X and I have an int star Y. And I allocate two integer arrays. And in the constructor the, the, the was X colon colon X of something and in there I write y equal new of something, new int of some size, and then x equal new int of some size. What if the first one succeeds, but the second one doesn't? Then I've allocated that memory, but now this one, it jumps out with an exception, and I have a problem. Yes. What's the solution? As I said, the solution is having each object be responsible only for a single resource. So I have to split it up. What is the easiest way of splitting up is I make an object that keeps track of an array. Stood vector, for example. Or our array class, or some smart pointer class. So here, the clean way of doing that is I use an object that treats, that has, has one resource, the vector of int x and y. And then I do, for example, y dot resize of some size and the x dot resize of some size. What happens now? If I get to here, it throws an exception. All of the member objects have their destructor being called and they're cleaned up nicely. So never manage two resources in one constructor or exactly what you mentioned might happen. If you manage one resource but then still later something might happen, let's say you do a new and think it's safer than later you check for something and throw an exception then you either have to clean up before you throw the exception or better yet we already have objects that manage memory. Let's just use them. The, the simplest is just using other objects that already do the, the task that you want. That leads me to another issue. Let's say, for example, I make, so yeah, we have this array class. I should be able to find it. And let's think whether we can make it exception safe. What do I mean by exception safe? By exception safe, I mean that if I try to attempt some operation and it throws an exception, the object should still be in a valid state. So what is the valid state of the array class? The valid state was that if the size is zero, the pointer could be zero. If the size is non-zero, the pointer pointed to a valid region of memory of that size. Was it week four? Well, 
So let's look at this array class and let's look at if we had a few versions of the of the assignment. Let's look at this first version of the assignment, which was bad as we know, because the first version we deleted the vector, and then, uh, which was bad in case of the self assignment. But then we, okay, let's ignore that. And now let's do the assignment and let's just assume this assignment here of the new array fails, it throws an exception. If that new statement throws an exception, then this array is in an illegal state because the memory was already deleted. The pointer is still the old pointer, but it points to memory region that no longer exists. So my object has become invalid, and that means it is not exception safe. Exception safe means the object should still be in a valid state even if an exception happens. So here in this version, we check this, and now we make the, so here we check for the self-assignment, but we still haven't solved that problem. How can we fix it? How can we fix it that if the new fails, it's still safe? One way we can do that is we can actually take this and we move it up. We can do this in new key pointer w equal new t of st. We first attempt to allocate the memory. If that fails, the array is unchanged. If it succeeds, then we can delete it and then we assign it. That way it becomes exception safe, right? If there's a problem with the new, the array is unchanged. So always first try those things that might throw an exception, only then change your object. Or in the other case, so, but what's the problem here? The problem here is that now we might need the memory for the old and the new array. And that's also bad. So, but this is what is called strong that's exception safety. If something bad happens, the object is unchanged, is still in the old state. The strong uh, exception safety here means I have to keep the old array around and at the same time I try to allocate the new one. If I'm tied with memory, that might not work. So the other option I have is I can go for weak exception safety. Weak exception safety means the object might be changed but it's still in a valid state. So here's what I need to do. Let me go there. How can you make sure that it's in a valid state? After this point, after I delete it. Yeah? Okay, you can catch an exception, and if you catch it, you set the point of zero, and then you rethrow the exception. Yeah. Yes. So or maybe easier and cheaper, you should set the pointer to zero and the size to zero. It's the same idea. Let's just always do it because it's cheap. It's much cheaper than catching an exception. And if it succeeds, then I set the size. So now, if the new has a problem, at least the array is in a valid state, namely of size zero. You, you, you lost the contents, but it's still valid. But we have the much cheaper version with the copy and swap trick that we in the end did. That was just totally safe. Because now, now we've delegated the problem to the constructor. And if the copying fails, it's unchanged. So the copy and swap trick we had here not only made the code short, it also made it exception safe. But this is also one reason why I prefer a third of exceptions because with a third you can do anything, you don't have to care about any safety. You just should not call the assignment if Memory might fail. Okay, that's bad. But you should not call Simpson with zero steps. Yes. Allocation is something that can fail without the user being able to check for it beforehand, and so that should throw an exception. 
Any more questions? If not, let me go on. I want to now show you a few examples of how we can do a stack class and first how we can do it in any procedural language. Like what we could also do in Fortran or in C or in <laughs> anything. And here I want to have a stack and the stack is nothing but a fixed size array of numbers. So I write double stack of 1000 and then the way I I fill the stack is I keep a pointer to the start and when I put something in with a function push that I call, so called push of p comma 10, then it takes the point and the value, it assigns the value to the pointer and it increments the pointer. And pop takes the last value of the, of the stack and then it decrements the pointer and so we have a stack very easily. We don't need classes, we don't need headers, we don't need modules and namespaces. It's just beautiful. It's easy. That's how we programmed 30 years ago. And it worked. But we have to be careful because you can easily push once and pop twice and nobody will realize something bad until the program crashes with a sack fault. But you always have to remember that there's this point P around and you have to remember to get the memory all, and it's manual. <laughs> Basically each time you want a stack, you program a, a simple stack from scratch. So then you can make it modular. You can encapsulate things and make a struct stack that has in this case the, 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 the pointer to, to, to the stack, it has the pointer to the current position, and it also has the size of the stack. That's my struct. And then I have a function in it that initializes it. I pass it the size L and the reference to such a the stack object S. I allocate the memory here. I set the pointer to the start and the st I save the, s the length of the stack in the level n. And I have a function destroy that cleans up afterwards. Then I have a function push and, and pop. And those, because they now have more than the pointer, the pointer and the size, I can actually check whether there's an overflow or an underflow. So it becomes much safer. But. I still have to create my stack, then I have to remember to call the init function to in initialize it to a valid stack. Then I can, can call push and pop, and that's fine. When I call another pop, it throws an exception, that's nice. But at the end, when I'm done using it, I have to manually call the function destroy to destroy it. So this thing is nicer because it's encapsulated, it's in a namespace, it's in a library but you have to manually remember to initialize it and, uh, and destroy it. When you turn that into classes to make it get more object oriented, then basically we have the same. We still have the constructor that does the init, we have the destructor that does the same as the destroy function, but now the advantage of the, the, the objects of the classes is that the init and the, 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 the destroy function, so the constructor and the destructor, they are automatically called without you having to remember it. That makes it much safer. But it's, but it's just that it makes it safe. It's just some nice uh, extra feature that makes it safer. In principle, you can do anything in the Fortran style way in the first one. It works, it just gets safer and easier to use. And then when you do it generic, I can now, now template it on the type so that the stack works for any type. That makes it again more flexible and that's what a uh, few languages allow. And it's just easier to use. Okay. Now, 
think we've already looked at the version of the Simpson last time, right? With the, 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 the function object and, and you decoded that. So let's now go to the next part, namely, how do we optimize code? Do you care about optimizing code? Yeah? Who cares about optimizing code? Who cares about, who doesn't care whether the code is fast? There are many problems where people don't care because current laptops are just fast enough for anything. But computational science students and physics students, they of course care because we won't really push the limits of, of, of what is possible. So we can be very tempted to just try to write fast code from the start. However, as some already read before the lecture, I recommend that you do not optimize. And why is that? What is more important than your code running fast? Yeah? That it runs it all and that it runs correctly. Right? The first thing is, the first emphasis should be on having correct code. Once the code is correct, and uh, once it runs and it runs correctly, so there are two things. First, it has to run and not just crash, and then it has to, to give the right answer. Then you start caring about it being maybe too slow. But maybe the program needs only five minutes. Maybe you wanted it to run in a second, but it takes five minutes. So what do you do? Do you optimize? No, you just go for a coffee. If you don't have a coffee, you come to the, to the, to the office and I have some coffee for you. <laughs> but if it takes just five minutes, don't waste your time optimizing it. But if you want to run the program a million times, then you care whether it's a million seconds, which is years, or a million times five minutes, which takes forever. So once the program is too slow, then you have to start make, trying to make the program run faster. And so you might be tempted in going in and optimizing it, and you might have heard that integer operations are faster than floating point operations, or when you do this and that trick, the code runs faster, or when you don't use virtual functions, the code becomes faster, or when you don't use pointers, or this and that. You all might have heard about some tricks that you should do that make the code harder to read. Don't do it. But first, make sure that you compile in such a way that the compiler actually optimizes your code. If then it suddenly runs in, runs in a second, then you find the code is fast enough. If you run the program only once and it takes 10 hours, don't care, let it run overnight. If it takes two days, let it run on the weekend. If it, if it, if it takes a week, let it run over Christmas and don't waste your Christmas vacations on <laughs> optimizing it. But what if it's too slow because I really need to run that program a million times and it takes five minutes and I know five minutes times one million, that will never work. Then first think about, have you really used the optimal algorithm? Have you used the best data structure? Is there some library around that might do it faster than your own code? So that's why I ask to code or not to code and I want to convince you at first that you should try not to write code and not to optimize it. But then what if the program is still too slow? What should we do then? Should you just start looking at all pieces and trying to write each line faster? And my answer is no, don't do it, but use a so-called profiler to find out which parts of the code are slow. And then once you realize what function is slow, that there's one function that uses up 99.9% .9 of, of the time, then optimize that function because typically 99% of the time is spent in 1% of the code. So don't waste your time and optimize the rest. Now the question is, do you know which part of the code is slow? Some people might have a strong opinion that they think they know it. Some people say, I don't know which part is slow. That's the safer point of view. When I have a strong opinion of which part is slow, then I might totally have missed that actually the slow part of my code is not doing the Fourier transform, but reading a one gigabyte size text file. So 
So you might just have totally misjudged and it's some other place. So first you need to find out which part is low, and then you do by something called profiling. Now once you know which part is low, then you stare at this part of code, at these 20 lines of code that take your time, and you, you, you check again. Have I really used the best data structure? It's slow and I've used the list. Should I maybe use a vector instead of the list? Could that speed it up? Should I use a tree? Did I use the best algorithm for that? Check that. And only once you can really be sure that you know which function is slow and you've looked at it and you are totally confident that you use the best data structure and the best algorithm and there's no library that's faster then think about optimization, but not before. So first, how do we find out which part of the code is slow? We run a profiler on the Unix system. There's a tool called Prof often that you use, use by giving the minus P option. Then you run it and then you use Prof to look at it on Linux it is minus PG and it's called GProf. And that tells you exactly how much time is spent in which function. On the Mac there was a GProf, also they stopped having that with the client compiler, so I'll sh show you how to do it there. We could just do that right now. And I'll show you a program that I wrote in two versions where I think that both should do the same, if I'm naive. And then I want to show you how using profiling I can find out what it actually does. Here's my program. I do, so I take a vector and I call a function insert begin and a function insert end. What the one function does, it it inserts 100,000 times the number one at the beginning of the vector, and the insert end does 100,000 times the pushback, so it inserts the value at the end of the vector. Now, which of these functions is the slow one? Are they the same time? So which one should I optimize, insert begin or insert end? What's the complexity of inserting at the beginning of a vector? You're smart, so you, you, so you, you should know, right? And the beginning is linear, and at the end? Amortized, constant, right? So if it's implemented in a smart way, then the insert end should be much, much faster than the insert begin. But let's assume I don't know this. How can I find out? I can find out by running a profiler, and I need to copy that now to a Linux system. So in here, we now have the same profile.cpp. And I'm compiling it with C++, and I give them minus PG option. Yeah, or, or I think that is a slow machine, so let me change the loop to not to so much. If it's too fast, then you can always rerun it. Then I run the program. Okay, that wasn't too bad, and now it created also a file called gmon.out. And that file is not really readable. It's just some binary file. Uh, when I do, and when I want to print it, then it actually hangs my shell. So let me try again. Now don't even get onto the machine anymore. I think 
then I think the network is too slow because too many students are browsing the web. <laughs> Let me try another one. Okay, but while we try this, I can also do it on the Mac. But on the Mac, it's no longer supported because Apple does not use GCC anymore. The reason is the GNU license version 3, which means that any code, that if a company contributes any code to the latest GNU tools, then they waive the rights to any of their patents. And that's not what any company wants to do, and so they started writing their own compiler, the Clang compiler. And what we can do is, we, ah, we're in here. So, so we have this, and we, we can then type gprof, and the cheap and the can't open file ages out. Ah, okay, that. Ah, okay, I didn't get it onto the machine. Because I'm not online, because too many students use the internet. Okay, so let me go to, let me switch this silent. Lecture examples week 11. What I can do is I can also just compile it here, the profile.cpp, and now I can call a co call something called the instruments on the Mac. And that tells me I need to give it a template. And when I do instruments minus S, it tells me which ones there are, and I want the timer. That one can find and will show you in the exercises where where's the timer? Does anybody see? Yeah, timer. Slower, smaller. Time profile dot trace template. So the instrument minus T of this one. And I give the program and now it runs. That runs a bit longer because we still have this fifty fifty repetitions. And then, 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 what this does is it runs the program, and like every few microseconds, it checks in which function is my program right now, and it stores that in a trace, and the trace I can then look at, and then I can see where does my program spend the time, and if your program spends 99.9% .9 of the time in one function, then this tool will actually find it. And so here, you see, it's done, and it put the output into this trace file, which I can open. And Mac have this GUI now, which you can open, it tells me it spent 33,000 milliseconds in start, it spent 33,000 milliseconds in main, and in main it spent 99.7% of the time in insert begin, and 76 milliseconds, or 0.2, percent of the time in insert end. That's what we expected. And, but it shows you directly. That's where the time is spent. And it can go in there, where is the time wasted? And actually most of the time is in that insert call to the vector, and then most of the time is spent in, yes, inside this insert call, and there is spent in the move range. So it's when you move the data around. The move range then goes down and it goes into some platform mem move. So most of the time is spent in moving memory around which is what we expected, right? When we insert at the start, then it actually just moves the memory around and we see it here. So you see immediately directly where is the time spent, and so we know now we have to, to optimize the insert begin. Now, what would you do to optimize that code? If that's really what I want to do, I want to insert the beginning and the end. Then we don't start writing a faster insert begin, but we rethink the data structures. What we do is we realize that actually if we want to insert at the beginning and the end, then I should use a DEC data structure. So we change it to a DEC and it will be fast. So the next choice is then use the data structure that's best once you find out where things are slow. 
And the basic rule, uh, if you need random access you want, then, uh, then put the array or a vector. If you want to the insert and to, to move somewhere in the middle, I want the list. If I need both, I want the tree. If you want to the insert at the beginning and the end, I use a tag. And whenever possible, I use uh, the, the, the standard data structure. If that's, that's not possible, I write my own data structure and make it standard. That, that, you're, that you're conformant. So now we can try and we can do that for uh, the Panda code. Which data structure did, did you use in the Panda model? A list? Anybody who did not use a list? No, I told you to use a list, but we'll change it. Now's the time to change it. Why did we use a list? Because we needed to insert at the end, but we wanted to remove anywhere in the middle even. So a list seemed the right choice. If we do the profile, we will find out that most of the time we spend in insertion and removal from a list. So if we want to optimize the Panda code, it's the data structure that we should optimize. And we can find better data structures. Because the insertion, at the, so let's say we use a vector. A vector is always nice in memory. It's just a nice array. There are the cache effects and it's fast. So whenever possible, we should try to use a vector. But why can't I use a vector? I can't use a vector because I want to remove the dead animals even from the middle of the vector. So can we still use a vector? Not if we want to keep the order of the animals, right? Why is, it why is the vector removal from the middle slow? Because when I remove an element, I move all the other ones from the end one step to the left. That's my large vector. And I want to remove this element. Then I had to move all the other ones, one element to the left. And that is slow. But that's what I have to do if I want to keep the order. If I want to keep the order. Do I care about the order of the animals in the panda model? No, I don't. So how about if you do the following? Instead of moving this, let me just move the last one to that location. Let me just replace the animal by the last one. Let me then remove the last one. Removing the last is fast. Right? I just change the size. So here you see I can make a data structure. That's like a vector, but when I remove an element, I simply move the last element to the location of the one that I remove. It totally changes the order. It's a bit different semantics, the meaning of the, 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 the remove is different, but it will make the code much faster. So, so now what we can do is we can make a new data structure that's basically like a vector, but which, which has a function <laughs> remove if that removes all elements for which the predicate is false. So all the dead ones, for example, but not by moving the rest forwards, but by moving the last one to that position. And I've written that code for you so that we can look at it. We have this panda vector HPP. And now I want to implement a totally standard conforming container. And the easiest thing of doing that is I just publicly derive from std vector. So it inherits everything from std vector, and I'm just going to change a few little, few little things. I still need some type devs, I need the constructors, but the constructors just all forward to that of the base type. So I, and the one thing I'm adding to the std vector, that's the only thing I add, is a function remove if. Because it was the function remove if that we used also for the, from the list in the panda model code. So now here, I'm just making a loop where I go through it, and if the predicate of something is true, so, so those which you want to remove, then I copy the last element, which is this, points to back. The last element gets copied to the current position, and the size gets reduced by one. 
If I don't want to remove it, I just increment the iterator to the next location. This is a new data structure that I can just swap out with a set list. I have to change one line in the panda code and I have to include, include this header. So it's two lines that I change. I have a new data structure that should be much faster. And because we designed this new new type that then we have the panda vector to th satisfy all the concepts of a st st standard container, it's just a plug-in replacement, it just works. So try to see how, how much faster your code becomes using this vector. So what this teaches us is sometimes you have to think out of the box. Be smart and that way you can really make your code much faster with very small changes. And the other thing is the choice of algorithms. You've all heard of uh, fast Fourier transforms. A simple naive Fourier transform takes n squared operation, a fast Fourier transform takes n log n operations. I've had one postdoc who wrote the code for a 3D Fourier transform of a big data set of 512 cube data which we wanted to transform and the code unfortunately took four hours. because he had an n to the 6 algorithm implemented. What's the scaling of a Fourier transform in 3D? You can do a loop over kx, ky, kc, xyc, and then in six loops, and it's n to the 6. Or you can be smart, and so what is the, the, the complexity really? Is it set to n to the 6? Probably not. So a 3D Fourier transform you can do by doing three separate Fourier transforms in the X direction, in the Y direction, and in, in the C direction. Now it goes from N to the 6 to 3 times, the, to 3 the times, and then I'm doing N squared times N squared. So, so it goes to 3 times N to the 4, and using fast Fourier transform, it goes to 3 times N cubed times log N. That helped. The code still took 10 minutes because it took just 10 minutes to read in the text file. We changed it to binary and it went down to a few seconds. So just knowing the, the complexity can really help. So fast Fourier transforms. Then adding matrices takes n squared. There's no way around simply because we have to read n squared numbers and we have to write n squared numbers. But multiplying matrices and the naive algorithm takes n cubed. Because there are three loops, i, j, k, and then a, i, j equals b, i, k times c, k, j. But then the data I have to write is only n squared, and the data I have to read is 2n squared. So potentially it can be done better. And there's a conjecture that we can in principle do it in like n to the power of 2 plus epsilon. In principle because the constants might be large. What we know and what's useful is the Strassen algorithm. Who, who has heard about the Strassen algorithm? Do you know where it was invented? Where was Strassen? He worked in Zurich. And one can improve it, and that goes only to roughly like n to the power of 2.8. There's uh, another one by the Copper, uh, Smith and Wienergrad that goes l like near n to the power of 2.37, but it's totally slow that, that unless n is so big that you cannot wait for the thing to finish, it has not an advantage. The scaling is better, but the constants are worse. So for large and asymptotically, if you're willing to wait for a year, then you can use a big enough matrix, then it might be useful. But for practical reasons, the Strassen one is enough. And I'll show the Strassen and then we make a break. The idea of Strassen is that we want to multiply matrices C equal A times B. And let me break up the matrix into blocks. I break up the matrices into four blocks of half the size. C 
C11, C12, C21, and C22, and the same for A and B. And what is the expensive part? The expensive part is multiplying matrices. So now I can write out what is the equation for C11. And C11 is just A11 times B11 plus A12 times B21. So I can simply write down the trivial multiplication, and I will find I will have to do eight multiplication, because for each block, I need to do two multiplications. C11 is A11 times B11 plus A12 times B21. So it's eight multiplications of half the size, and that's just the n-cube scaling coming in here. But Strassen found a clever way how doing lots of multiplications and addition, he can do seven multiplications to get some values Q1 to Q7, from which he then can construct those blocks. So when splitting the matrices into four blocks of half the size, he only needs seven multiplications instead of eight of half the size. And the copper Smith method does even more additions, but he needs only six multiplications. And then you can check what is the, 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 the complexity. The standard one needs the n cube, the cube no, yeah, the multiplications. The Strassen is less. And what it needs is the Strassen for size n does seven multiplications. And those seven are of half the size. And they can again use Strassen recursively. So the time complexity is I'm doing seven multiplications. So the Strassen is seven times Strassen of half the size, plus I'm doing 18 additions or a subtraction of matrices of half the size. But the n squared term I can drop because it's uh, the subdominant compared to the, the multiplication. And so the complexity for the Strassen of size n is seven times that of half the size. And what is the function which, when I multiply the argument by two, gives me seven times the value? That is the function n to the power of log seven over log two, or n to the power of 2.8. And that's where the scaling comes from. For the naive one, I would have eight multiplications. Then it's then it's log eight over log two. And that is just the three from the n cubed. Strassen brings it down a bit. Now, do you want to implement the Strassen algorithm? I encourage you to, but maybe it's better to actually find a library where it's already implemented. Okay, let's make a break, and then I tell you how to, 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 to find libraries, what exists, and how you can optimize when you have to optimize. So the break first of 10 minutes. Okay, so then how do we find the best algorithms? If you had known about Strassen, how would you have found it? There are books that you should look at. The books by Knuth, there are journals to look. There's the internet that uh, can search for things. There are friends you can ask. There are professors that you can ask or assistants. There's a famous book called The, 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 the Numerical Recipes. Who has heard about that book? Who has it? This is a nice, useful book, and the purpose of the book was to enable people in pre-internet times to have something at home where they can just look up something simple that works. It's a book that just lets you look something up and you get an algorithm that works and that's pretty easy to code. These are not the best algorithms, but they are useful ones. Nowadays, when we are usually online, it's much easier to get something better than, than in the book. But the easiest solution is, in the end, to use a library, because libraries are usually bug-free, or, well, less buggy than the codes that you write on a the weekend. They are optimized, or maybe not the best, but uh, they're typically better than you can do. They have at least a little bit more documentation than most of your homeworks, I guess. And they are a bit more supported. And if you've never found a place where you look for libraries, you can look at netlife.org. 
that the you that the web page in engine one with lots and lots of libraries but the internet is low today you should, okay here we have it there have been 765 million downloads from the web page you think that beats most of the youtube movies and you have a long list of libraries that one can look at pages of them with cryptic names many fortran libraries Remember, Fortran is a language that some people used to use in the past. <laughs> some people use it even nowadays. Who uses Fortran? Good. Fraction is going down. It's a useful language, and the reason why it's still around is because there are lots of libraries and codes around that use it and that are useful. So here there are lots of useful Fortran libraries, and we'll use some of, some of them. We look at the library like Blast, this one, and Atlas, and there's Blast, and LA Pack, and others. Beautiful, useful Fortran libraries. But libraries will be for later. For now, I want to look at optimizing code, and we want to look at how to optimize codes yourself. Why do I tell you that? Because you are computation scientists or computation physicists who are not just code users, but you also write code. And if you want to write one of those nicely documented, debugged, portable, and optimized libraries, then you have to know how to optimize it. And you can optimize, and I start at the low level in assembly language. Don't be afraid. I show you things that you should do and things that you no longer have to do, and then next week I'll show you beautiful ways how to optimize in, in C++. First, assembly language. There are some instructions that your CPU has that you cannot access from a high level, like how to count the bits in an integer or the parity of bits in an integer. How do you calculate it? You can go through it in a loop and count up to 32, and you get out the number of bits. Or you do one machine language call, and you have it much faster. So if your code relies on often calculating and counting the number of bits in an integer, then you have to think about learning a bit about assembly language. But if you do that, the best is to wrap that into a function call, call this function, then you have a nice library that people can use. Uh, for example, here, let's look at something. You want to count how many zeros are there before the first one bit. It basically takes the logarithm base 2 of an integer. How many leading zeros are there in a word? You can make a loop where you just start counting from the, the highest bit down. You count one, two, three, four, five. And when you hit the first one, you stop the loop, and then you have the number of leading zeros. That's nice. But if we have an IBM Power CPU, then it has a built-in instruction, CNT LCW, Kintlsp. Count leading zeros in a word, Kintlsp. And it takes two arguments, namely it takes one argument is where you count a register and one register where you write to. But now we don't want to write the code in assembly language. We want to write it in C++ or in C. And so what we have in the compiler is the ASM statement, assembly language. Now you can put in an inline assembly statement. And this is a bit cryptic, so let us look at that in a bit detail. What this is, the, the ASM just puts in the assembly language statement. Then the Kintlsp is the statement, and it takes two registers of the CPU, and it counts the bits in one register, and it puts it into the other. Now the problem is, in C++, we don't have access to the registers. So what can we do? We have to somehow tell the compiler how to map registers to variables, and this is how it's done, is that the first one is the output one, 
So the variable C, which is the count here, that should be put into, into a register and I'm going to assign into it. So the value has to be copied out at the end into C. That's what the equal R means. That's a register into which some, something will be assigned. And that is the first argument, C. That is the percentage zero. And percentage one refers to a register in which the compiler should put the variable X. And that's where you can map the variables you have, X and C, to registers and use them in the call. I just want to show you that it's possible. What is nicer is if you package that into a library or you find it that somebody has written a beautiful library that does it for you, that packages that in a portable way, documented and tested. But let me show you one case where we really need it. Here I want, so how do we do 64-bit additions if we have a 32-bit machine? Who knows that? In primary school, you learned how to add double-digit numbers, how to add 18 plus 13. How do we add 18 plus 13 if you can count, if we can add only numbers up to 10? 8 plus 3 is 11. We put down 1, and 1 is a carry, which we go on, and then we do 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, so it's 30, 31. And th the same thing here. We can only do 32-bit additions. If we, do, if we want to do a 64-bit one, we have to add the lower 32 bits. We get the carry, and then we add the higher ones with the carry. But on a 64-bit machine, I can do that in one step. So let me try to actually do that, and then we think about what if we need to do 128-bit integers. So I, do, I have it here. I have an add64.cpp. There's a very simple function. I'm just adding two long longs, x and y, and return x plus y. Let me compile it. Let me let me try to optimize it. C plus minus O3 minus C minus save temps. And we look at this and here it has done it for my current machine and all it did is okay, here we have a statement and add. The sing single add statement, that's just because I have a 64-bit machine and it optimizes for that. Can we optimize it just for a 32? Can, can we compile the code for a 32-bit machine with the option minus M32? Now it creates only 32-bit code so that it runs even on an older 32-bit machine. And now it looks different. Now when we look at it, there's an add, there's an addl, and there's an add C L. An add of longs. So that does a 32-bit addition, and the add C is the add with carry. So I'm first adding up the lower 32 bits, the lower digit. I keep the carry, and then I'm adding up the higher words with the carry. Good. Now, how would you add a 128-bit number? You add the lowest 32 bits without the carry. You keep the carry, you add the next 32 bits. You keep the carry, you add the third 32 bits and the fourth 32 bits. So, so let's say we have a code and we have one student who has to often actually add 512-bit integers. That's what his code does most of the time. So he needs something like this. So here let us construct a simple int128 where I have this struct, which has two 64-bit words, the answer long, long, low, and the long, long, high for the low and high 64 bits. And I can add this by doing an operator plus. And the operator plus, it just it adds the low 64 bits, and then it adds the high 64 bits. But if I do it like this, then it gives me the wrong results because the second addition 
doesn't take into account the carry of the first one. If the lower DR64 bits overflow, then I have to add one to the higher ones. So how can I do that? One way is I can put in if statements and I can check beforehand if the lower ones will overflow and if yes, then I add one to the higher one. That makes the code slower. Or I say, okay, do the second addition, but use the carry bit of the first one. But I don't have access to the carry bit in C++. So what can I do? I can use inline assembly, or I can just use assembly language straight away. Both seem a bit scary, right? Let me show you a trick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that add 128. I'm going to look at the assembly language code that it produces. Uh, is that the add 128? No. The add 128.s. And there I see it's doing an add and an add with carry. And then it does another add and another add with carry. Just going in here and I'm changing the one add to an add with carry. I'm adding the lowest bit and then the higher, higher, higher ones and, and I'm always doing the add with carry. And I save it and I send that file to the assembler and I have a beautiful library. I just patched the assembly language file. I didn't have to write it from scratch. I just have to see how can I fix it up and patch it and make it. And I've written an assembly language library now. So, you, so there are many tricks you can do and it will really make the codes much faster in that case. So when you have something where you think that using assembly language will really speed up your code, like if you have, have to use many 128-bit integers, then do it, it's worth it. Ask friends, you have to check with us, it can really speed up your code. We also ported that code to GPUs. And on GPUs, there's this CUDA language which we used, and we had the same problem. We wanted to do 512 bit integers, and there's no carry bit to which we had access. We asked, and no, there's no carry bit. So we wrote the code, and it was slow, and then NVIDIA offered us help to optimize it. So we sent the code to them. They sent it to one of their gurus in Moscow, who sent us back some GPU assembly language code. Officially, that doesn't exist. It's not supported, it's not documented, but they helped us, and the code was five times faster. So with help of the experts, you can really get fast code. But the good news is that people realize that we don't want to write in assembly. And so for the bit count, for example, it's a bit easier if you have an Intel CPU. The bit count is an assembly language instruction that gives you the number of bits in an integer. And the stupid way of doing it is a loop like this, where I just count up, and if a certain bit is set to one, then I increase the count and the shift the bits to the right. So I check every bit, and when it's one, I count up one. This is a slow loop because it counts up to the word size. Or on a modern Intel CPU, there's a function called underscore mm underscore pop count, the pop count, that counts the number of bits. This is an assembly language instruction that looks like a function which the compiler knows. When you call this function, then the compiler inserts the, the assembly language statements to count those number of bits for you. So there are many such intrinsic functions that look like functions because this is a way of exposing the, 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 the machine language capabilities to the, the, the high-level user. And that's used much more now. So for most operations, you don't need, it, need assembly language because we have those intrinsics. 
And next, let's say we don't want to write assembly language and we don't have any intrinsic. Should we then sit down and optimize the code? And so we will discuss a few things, but while we discuss that, we also will discuss what the compiler can do for you. So you should sometimes sit down and try to optimize the code, but only after you know which function is slow. And only after you know what the compiler has already done for you. And the first thing is you have to tell the compiler to optimize it, and that you can do by using an option like minus D and debug that switches off the asserts that makes it faster. Then you can use minus O to switch on optimization, or it can be a bit more specific. Minus O1 turns on some optimization, O2 turns on more, O3 even more, and O4 and O5 even more, and some compilers even have O6. Don't use them. One of my students had used minus, had, had written a code and it ran for a year, and he first checked it, and then he switched on minus 06, and he ran it for a year. And then after a year, when he did the final summation of all the numbers, some checks, some came out wrong, and he realized that the compiler had made a bug. Because the more you optimize, the more likely that your compiler introduces bugs in your code. Without optimizing, there are some compilers that are bug-free. The more you optimize, when you optimize a bit, there's no compiler that's totally bug-free. When you go to O3 and you find a bug and you report it to the, the compiler vendor, they say, okay, thank you, but we don't have time to fix those bugs. O4 and O5, they will, in, they will just delete it because they say that's used at your own risk. O2, they might fix it at some point when they get around to it. When there's something without optimizing, then they will fix it quickly. So I would go at most to O3. But it can also be that when you go to a higher level, like O3, that your code becomes slower than at O2. Why that? It might inline a function. That sounds good. But inline a function makes the code bigger. Then maybe your code no longer fits into the cache, and you get a cache miss in your code, which might make the program run slower. So first make sure your code actually works, only then slowly switch on O1 and O2, and if you see it, it's much faster at O2, then O1, then run it at O2, if it's still correct. Then go to O3, if it's a tiny bit faster, don't bother, it's just too risky. To debug it, use minus O0, minus G, and that, may, that is safe for the testing and the profiler and the debugger know all of the function names and can tell you exactly which function was slow now. What I want you to do is you should look at your compiler, whatever bar you use, and I want you to find out by reading the man page or the manual of the compiler or by, by playing with it, what do the levels of 1 to 5 do? And at which level is a function inlined? Does the compiler inline a function when you write minus O0 when you don't optimize, or does it only inline it when you do O1 or O2? So which level do you have to turn on that the function gets inlined when it's marked as inline? Which level or which option does the compiler have to forcefully inline each function that it can even when you have not marked it as inline? Which options cause the compiler to try to unroll a loop? Which options cause the compiler to make mistakes in calculations on the last digits to make the code faster? Not checking for infinities, making unsafe roundings to make the, the, the code faster. Such things exist. Try to find those options. And most importantly, if you compile a code, then most of the time it's not optimized for your machine because it assumes that you might give the code to to a friend, to a friend who wants to run it. If you want the fastest code, you might want to compile it specifically for the CPU in your laptop and use all the features of that. Which options do you have to use with your compiler to get that code that will run on 
on your latest Ivy Bridge machine, but not on some other machine. Finding out that's useful and homework. Now, what might you think that you should optimize? Copy propagation. You write x equal y and c and then c equal 1 plus x. Why? I might optimize it to x equal y and c equal 1 plus y, and the reason being that the 1 plus x in the first row, I can only start after I've written y into x. So I have to write y into x, then I have to read x, and then I can start the calculation of 1 plus x. In the second version, if you write 1 plus y, then I can do the two operations in parallel. I can write and immediately I can start with the addition. You don't have to do that because the compiler can do that automatically. Smart enough to realize it. Same here, I have const int x equal 100 and then write int c equal 2 times x. Should I replace the 2 times x by 200? It's not needed because that can be done at compile time. 2 times 100 can be calculated by the compiler to be 200. Anything with integer operation that can be done at compile time is done at compile time. Let's say we have a code where I write if, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, yeah, yeah, n less than 1, print something for an exception and so on. But before that, you just wrote int n equal 100. So now you know that n will never be less than 1. Should you remove that code? You don't have to because the compiler can realize if n equal 100, then in the next line it's not less than 1. And thus that statement is always false, and so it will not be, be run ever. And then the code is removed by the compiler. The compiler is smart enough for that. You might have heard that adding numbers is cheaper than multiplying numbers. So instead of doing 2 times y, let me do just y plus y, or just a left shift by 1. It's faster, right? But the compiler vendor also know that, and they have done that for you already. They do that in the fast, but there's no need for you to optimize it, because the compiler can do these simple things. Same here, I write int x equal y times c, and then I write q, and that uses x, and then I change x afterwards. Now I can only start the last one after I finish the, the second line. But if I change the name of this x to x naught, then I can do all things in parallel. So if I just change the names of variables, then I can do more things pipeline. Again, the compiler is smart enough because this is a common problem. Here we have the same expression a plus b appearing twice. Should I store it in a temporary and then use it? No, because the compiler can recognize that and save you the work and it just looks cleaner without that. However, now we come to the first one where you have to do something what you have to manually change is, in this case, I'm calling the function f of x twice. I can optimize it and store the result in a temporary variable. And the compiler will not do that for you. The reason being, the compiler cannot know in general whether the function f has some side effects. It cannot know whether f of x always gives you the same result when you call it twice. f might be your random number generator. After all, yeah. Uh, why is it called a square root function? Is it the same, or uh, I have to say uh, double result as the usual square root? Function? For the square root function, a good compiler should probably optimize it because the because it might know that hey, I know that because it's my built-in function, and I know that that's the same, and then it's safe. Yes, a good aggressive compiler should be able to do that. There's a simple way to check. Compile it with 05 or 03 and look at the assembly code. Do you call the function twice or once? And then you see, hey, it's, n it, it's not doing it, so I should better do it. 
Then here, what if you assign, for example, the g of k into e, which is stupid because it never changes. You can't just put that outside of the loop. If I do a statement that I could as well put outside of the loop, the compiler will do it for you. Again, only as long as it doesn't involve a function call. When it involves a function call, then maybe that function g of y actually does something in the loop, and each time you call it, the, the result is different. When it's a square root, again, then a good compiler should be able to move it out and optimize it away. When it's some other function, it can't do it. Then, what if you make a loop for i from 0 to n, and inside I write k equal 4 times i plus m? For some reason, whatever reason. Shouldn't I change it to just doing a k plus equal 4? I start with m and I do plus equal 4. The answer is you don't have to do it because this is so common that there are built in machine language statements to do that. Because this is basically always what you do inside a loop. When I do x subscript 4 times i, this is your star of x plus 4 times i. And subscripts are so often that those things just get optimized the way to the fastest possible code. So, so you can do the loop with, the loop with an index or the loop with pointers. The runtime should be the same because this is so common that the compilers have learned to optimize it. Loop unrolling is important. If you have a short loop, let's say up to three, and I write s plus equal xi times yi. I want to just do a scalar product. Should I do a for loop where I said i equals zero? I check is i less than three? No. So I do s plus equal x zero times y zero. I increment i to one. I check is y less than three? Yes. So I continue and so on. And it takes just much more time than just writing it out explicitly x zero times y zero plus x one times y one plus x2 times y2, that's faster. Does the compiler do that automatically? Some do, some don't. They want you to find out which options you have to give the compiler to unroll such a loop. I write here on GCC, it's often minus f unroll loops, check whether it works. On, on the, the, the Clang compiler can be different, or Microsoft can be different, find out. Partial loop unrolling is useful because if you, you have a long loop and, and if you split it, then you always do four iterations at once. And those can be pipelined, the code can be faster, some compilers can do it, some don't. Try to find out whether your compiler does it. If you know what your, your compiler can do, then you know that you don't have to do it manually. If your compiler can't do it, then you might, might want to look into that. So f find out which options you have to give it to do it and if it can do it. And then this is now, I think, here I should stop and the rest we we're going to do next week. <laughs>